Welcome to the podcast. We're street smart, business smart, all kinds of smart people share their insights into the world of marketing, career journeys, and personal growth. So sit back and prepare to get enlightened with your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the podcast, where I bring you the best and brightest from the world of business, marketing, and personal growth to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your career forward. I am thrilled to introduce my guest today on the show, Julian Placino, and we've built an online and offline relationship that has culminated with the co-creation of an industry event this past September in Dallas, and I'll certainly dig into that in a little bit, something we are both very proud of. And in my opinion, our relationship is an incredible example of the power of real networking. And when we were initially connected about a year ago by my friend and mutual connection, Brian Altamari, we had a networking chat and Julian graciously invited me onto his Pathways to Success podcast to share my story. And that evolved to where we are today and more to come on that. Julian is a Fortune 500 speaker who has spoken hundreds of times at various corporations, conferences, universities, and everything in between. He's also the host of the extremely successful aforementioned podcast, Pathways to Success, where he interviews exceptional leaders about their journeys. And he's had on some amazing folks, CEOs, New York Times bestselling authors, TEDx speakers, celebrity athletes, and prolific entrepreneurs like myself. Yes, somehow I stuck my way on there. And he does much more, including modeling, acting, and was recently cast in an Amazon Prime docuseries, The Social Movement, which is a reality TV show about creating social impact through entrepreneurship. And I think that's coming out next summer, right? July 2020, right? July 2020. But his core background is 11 years of professional recruiting and experience. And that has helped them leading to help corporations leading to attract, recruit, and retain top talent. And he's personally hired, hired over 400 professionals across tech, sales, and the creative arts. And for seven years, he led talent at Bottle Rocket, one of the premier mobile app development firms in the world. And now he consults with staffing firms on business development strategy, strategy performance coaching, content creation, and employer branding. This might be one of my longest, longest, long-winded <laughs> intros, but it's so, so well worth it. And let's get to it. Julian Placino, welcome to the podcast. Adam, thank you for having me on, man. It's a pleasure. Awesome. Good stuff. And I love your story. And I think I covered most of it. But let's talk about that. 11 years in corporate America. And recently, you decided to leave a fantastic job and go out on your own. Let's pull back the curtain on that and talk about that decision. What led you to that? Yeah, you know, honestly, I have been in talent acquisition for the past 12 years. And although I've been working in the corporate world, I personally have been very entrepreneurial. I've done a lot of things like network marketing, internet business, and real estate just to kind of chase a buck. And around 2016, I was kind of burning out out of trying to find my entrepreneurial identity. And as you mentioned, I work for Bottle Rocket. And Bottle Rocket is unique in the sense that a lot of times we talk about this idea of doing work that we love. And they're very different in the sense that not only do we discuss this idea, but we put it into practice. And one of the ways we do this is by something called rocket science, which is a 24 hour hackathon where you can build anything that you want. Well, for me, I always loved interviewing interesting people. And that's when I started the podcast, yep. the pathways to success and 162 episodes later, I became a sponsored podcaster, professionally represented actor and model keynote speaker, built a consulting company, which replaced my income. So I'm a really big believer in doing work that you love. I love it, man. And I think that's something that, that drew us to each other. We, we both have that passion. Another interesting point too, is about the podcast. And for me, you know, my podcast is my canvas. And we spoke about this before at, at our event, like, my network is my net worth. And that's what I'm sharing with my audience here. And I'm able to showcase people like yourself who add so much value. And this is my palette. This is my, these are my connections and, and I'm bringing that to life. So how long, how long, how long since you left um, uh, Bottle Rocket? March, 2019. Okay, great. So we're, we're, we're coming up, we're, we're rounding the corner. We're almost at that one year point. And what, what, what was that first big mistake that you've made as a, as a solopreneur? And what did you learn from that? What's, you know, we're early in on that, but what's a big mistake that you made? <laughs> I think there's a lot of mistakes, but I think whenever you first start pursuing ideas of entrepreneurship, one of the things that I hoped that I was going to get was this idea of time freedom. And when I was able to pull it off, I had so much choice, but man, I just kept saying yes to everything. So if there's one thing 
that I learned was the importance of saying no. Because when you say yes to everything, you sort of dilute your efforts in a lot of different ways. So for me, it's prioritization and sort of lovingly and respectfully telling people no when you can't take on specific opportunities. Like you and I had this very honest discussion about right. talent meets influence, right? Um, but we saw the benefit in it. We were able to delegate different parts and make it come into fruition, and it was a huge success. So learning to say no and prioritizing your efforts. Yeah, that's hard too, and especially as recruiters too. A lot of a lot of people reach out to us for for our time, and it's we want like we're empathetic and we want to give our time. We're generous people. We want to give our time to everybody, but there has to be a line, right? Yep. We have to be focused on things that are revenue generating and taking it, taking care of our, our clients' needs. So, what do you feel is this biggest misconception of of the process from going from corporate to entrepreneur lifestyle? Like everybody thinks you're kind of alluding to it before. You know, you're able to create your own time. You're able to create your own schedule. I mean, I, I, I don't, for me personally, I, I, I'm, I'm avoiding commuting, um, which has been a big productivity uh, enhancer. But what's a big misconception that people have out there saying, you know, I've been in corporate America for 10, 15 years. I'm going to make that move uh, into entrepreneurship. I think a lot of new entrepreneurs sort of assume what would work without actually testing their product, right? So something that started to happen, having made this successful leap from corporate America into entrepreneurship is a lot of other individuals wanting to make that leap or asking me for coaching. And they're telling me, hey, I have this great idea. This is what I plan to do. The market's going to love it without any kind of evidence. For me, I started purely as a side hustle. So part of my story was creating this content on LinkedIn for recruiters. Well, what started to happen is all these recruiters started asking me for advice and for help and reaching out to me. Well, essentially what I saw was the market was telling me their pain points they're training pain points. Right. So what I did based on market intelligence was to take those top three pain points, turn it into a training product and then sell it. So while I was working at Bottle Rocket, I was sort of side hustling. And for me, I developed great relationships at Bottle Rocket with the executive leadership team. And I actually had approval to train my personal clients awesome. on company time every other Friday for six months. So how do you explain luck? I don't know. Yeah. But that's what I did first is I I, I turned ideas into a business first by testing it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's brilliant too. It's, it's testing into something before making the plunge. Right? And there's something to be said about making the full plunge, but like having that preparation, like going on a, on a whim and, and, and testing it, like, like there, there are two different things there and make sure that you're, uh, you're just smart um, about your, your decisions that you're making. So let's shift and talk about our little event and, and give a little yeah. bit of backstory on it. So I'll, I'll kind of fill everyone in here. So LinkedIn had their annual uh, convention this past September, about a, a week and a half ago, um, probably about uh, six weeks after this podcast actually airs. But going back to that, I got the email from LinkedIn. I'm like, oh, this looks cool. Looks like something you know I should be at as a recruiter, as a business owner. I could pack in three days of biz dev and learnings uh, all in you know a relatively short amount of time. So I made the investment. I signed up for it. Uh, and then this kind of light bulb went off in my head where I've been to conferences like South by Southwest, which is an incredible uh, conference in itself, but most of the action takes place off site. And I said, all these people, all these decision makers are going to be in one area for a set amount of time. We should do an event. So I reached out to Julian and I said, Hey Julian, I got this crazy idea about us doing an event and let's go back to one of our initial conversations and talk about that little bit of uncertainty that you had uh, in your mind about pulling this off. So something that I have been doing quite a bit since I left corporate America is speaking and I get pulled in to do a lot of different things, whether it's the keynote, whether it's a breakout session, whether it's emceeing an event. And this has been the busiest speaking season I think I've ever had. And that was one of those decision making criteria that we had to take seriously. Like we have so much going on right now. Is this something worth pulling off? Because if we do something, we want to make sure it's great. We want to do it right. So that was absolutely something that we, we had to consider. Yeah, and it was tough too because Julie and I went back and forth and we had a couple of those kind of epiphany moments, those real hardcore conversations like, are we doing this? Is it right? Is it worth our time? And, and looking back on it, it certainly was. And it was kind of this culmination of teamwork. We had Julian on the ground in Dallas. I was running point here in New York. We each had a divide and conquer. You know, I was driving the train forward. Julian was the gas behind it. And we, and we kept this thing on the tracks and it came to fruition. We pulled together great speakers. We had Craig Fisher, Courtney McAtee from MailChimp. And it all came together. It was an extremely successful event. Uh, Kyle Burt live streamed it. It was incredible. And now we're talking about, we have all this amazing content around talent meets influence. And now we're having a conversation. What do we do with that content? How do we put it out there where people 
um, could learn from it. And there's some things, some lessons learned. And some one big lesson for me, and I think it was it was tactical, as this was my first event. You know, we planned something in Dallas, which I am not a local of. I've only been there once before, and I was counting on a lot of people from the event coming, um, which turned out not to be so strong. But we had a lot of local people in the in the North Dallas region uh, who came, which was pretty awesome. But you know, I didn't take into an account that the distance between you know where the convention was, um, you know, and Dallas, which probably accounted for a little bit of the lower turnout from the people from Talent Connect um, mm -hmm. specifically. But all in all, it was really, uh, you know, a really fantastic and incredible event. And one of the things a lesson learned from me was preparation. And preparation, I look to you, which you do an incredible job. So why don't we talk a little bit about, you know, being an MC for one of these type of events, what kind of preparation goes into it? Well, for me, so this is um, probably maybe the 10th or 11th panel that I've done. So I have it kind of down to sort of a formula. So for me, I like to understand, number one, who's the audience, because that is ultimately who we're looking to serve, right? You start to draw the kind of audience of who you create content for. And in this case, it was about talent acquisition thought leadership. So we had already built the panel. So the first thing that I like to do is do a pre-interview with each of the, uh, of the experts. And from there, I start to understand kind of their philosophies, their strategies, their tactics, and anything that really kind of sticks out to me, I make sure to leave that as a point of discussion. So there's typically about a 30 minute pre-interview conversation that I have with each of them. Um, I do like to script the questions and send them to the guest ahead of time. And I understand the whole argument of like making it sure it's impromptu, but for me, I've tried it both ways. It just makes sense whenever you have your subjects bake in the questions ahead of time. It's just much more productive that way. Yeah, and I agree too. I mean, I was a guest on the panel as well. And having those questions in advance, it provided me the framework to really be more confident when I was up there and be prepared and not be blindsided. Now, yeah. I didn't memorize my questions. Mm -hmm. What I did was I thought about it. I even thought about it on the plane, which was pretty cool. Like I thought about how I'm going to answer them the best way. And that's certainly a tip. Um, for preparation. Now, how do you go about driving an audience both online? Let's talk about driving it, driving an, an offline people at the event. What are some tactics that you find pretty successful? What, what do you mean? Driving, driving guests to the event live in person, driving guests to the event. Honestly, it's, I have been fortunate enough to build up a little bit of a LinkedIn following. So when I first started in 2018, I had a little over 2000. Now I just passed 11,600. Awesome. And what I realized is that having a following is real equity. I was able to make real calls to action and drive people to physical places. So that is the primary place where I was distributing my calls to action to go to the event. Also, we have a great partner in City Central. Mm -hmm. That is where we are at right now and where I office out Big of. ups to City Central. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, if it wasn't really for Alexis to handle the marketing yeah, and the ticketing and they threw the team back here, set up the bar, they had a huge, huge effort in terms of like getting attendance here because yeah, we've got I mean, a great list. It was, it, was, it was awesome. And I can't wait to share yeah. that, that, that event with everybody. Let's, let's, let's shift gears a little bit. And, and, and mm -hmm. first of all, let's close it out. It was an awesome event. It really um, was. I hope to have you here in New York and return the favor on this side in, in 2000. I would love that, man. We're, we're, we're going to make that happen. It's definitely on the radar. Let's yep. talk about your podcast, Pathways to Success. Mm -hmm. Let's start in the beginning because I love the story of the first podcast. Talk to us about what that thought process was when you were like, I, should I do it? Should I not do it? And let's talk about that first episode. How'd you get there? Yeah, honestly, I think it... I think it really does echo my, my entrepreneurial journey. This was the first time I went to go do something that was a little bit selfishly for myself, where I didn't care about what quote unquote success was. I just knew that I got energy whenever I interviewed people that I liked being around. And in the beginning, I had no credibility as a podcaster. Right. Man, I interviewed my best friend. <laughs> I interviewed my sister. My dog. Yeah, I know. All right. And it's like, given that they still had extraordinary stories, I didn't really have people to talk to, but then I started to build a kind of a critical mass around episode like 20 people saw this work that I was creating. And then my guests started referring other guests and then it really started to snowball. And then I passed episode 100. And then people started to ask me to speak about podcasting, personal branding and entrepreneurship. And, and now booking agents are reaching, reaching out to me. And as you mentioned, now I've had company founders, CEOs, New York times, bestselling authors, That's awesome. and it continues to grow and expand. And if there's one really big thing I've gotten for the podcast, it has been the best professional networking tool I have ever seen. hundred percent. And what, what would you, what kind of advice would you give to someone out there who's looking to start their own podcast? I think there's really two ways to do it, right? There is, there's the much more analytical, maybe practical way, which is who's the audience you're trying to reach? How 
you craft the show to be of service to them and really kind of take that approach. We're kind of running it like a business. And I get that and that makes sense. I kind of took more of like the artist route, which was go create content that you love to do and don't care what anybody else says, right? And, and that seems to have worked out for me. So for me, in terms of starting to create a podcast is just get started and see what it turns into along the way. That's, that, that's, that's really interesting too. And, and what, what was a big mistake you made early on, you know, when launching the podcast and getting it out there? A mistake that you made and you learned from? I think for me, it was just trying to wait until everything was perfect. I think whenever people ask me about content creation advice, it really is just accept that the first piece, first pieces of content are not going to be great, but just like anything else, you know, rep, repetition builds skill and do Amen. it over and over and you get better along the way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and for me, I'm approaching 50, I'm rounding the turn on, uh, on, on episode 50. I think this one's 40 or 41, yeah. uh, which is incredible for me. And I, and I see my own progress as a podcaster, the confidence I build, um, the, the structure I have around the show, the preparation that goes into it, the ability to improv and go off, off script, the ability to really listen and understand the flow of a podcast mm -hmm. and be able to make that turn if I feel like something that I should go deeper on. And for me, um, that's really enhanced my ability um, as a podcast, so something that I commend you on is the sponsorship piece, something that eventually I'm going to be looking into. Um, and there's different levels of sponsorship, right? Like obviously when you start to reach that 25, 30,000 plus per episode show, then you're getting into a lot more of the, the, the more commercial national uh, sponsors as well. But how'd you go about getting your sponsorship at City Central? You know, honestly, I didn't even know that sponsorships were a possibility for me. And that's why I love this idea of finding mentors like Baylor Barbie. He's a best-selling author, uh, sponsored triathletes. And he's the one who I had on the podcast and first said, Julian, why aren't you reaching out to sponsors? And I was like, sponsor, are you kidding me? How could I possibly be sponsored by anything? Right. But he showed me kind of a formula and he has a very direct kind of outreach path. Right. So he kind of shared with me the sponsorship letter that he crafted, which took him 100 iterations to get his first sponsor right? And for me, I use, I started off with this product here, focus, right? Right. Mm. So he was like, why don't you start reaching out to the companies that you use equipment for already? You're kind of a natural brand ambassador. Well, it took him 100 iterations to get that first sponsorship letter to work. I basically used that template, reached out to the marketing team at focus, right? And pitched them my value. And I got sponsored on the first time that changed my mindset about yep. value that I can create for companies right? And then since then, Compete Every Day, Dead Soxy, uh, created a partnership with City Central and also the Network Bar. The way uh, City Central came into place is I did my first live podcast recording at the Network Bar. And in the Network Bar happened to be Mark Burge, who's the SVP of City Central. And he saw that I could use my medium to draw humans into physical yep. spaces. And he was like, hey, I want you to do that. And now I'm part of this community and I've grown so much as an entrepreneur. I love it, man. I'm looking to do that here at Bridgeworks here in, in Long yep. Island. Let's flip back a little bit to your early days of creating content on LinkedIn. And you and mm -hmm. I have talked about this like extensively. The last, I'll call it 18 months, LinkedIn has, has made this turn, man. It's turned into the wild west of content creation. And it is still, in my opinion, the number, it is the number one place of organic reach. How have you found success in content creation? Where have you found that real, um, that drive that's really drawing people to your, to your content? I think for me, and you preach about it all the time, man. It's like this idea of being authentic and being you. And for me, I have tried to achieve success like other people for the longest time, but right. it seems to come much more natural whenever I allow myself to be whatever it is that I am. I mean, I've posted pictures of me working out, of doing talking head videos of me doing speeches. Honestly, I just post whenever I'm passionate about a particular topic and it seems to be working. But what starts to happen is when you look at all of this content, much like a mosaic, when you zoom out, there's this big picture. It becomes like your life story. I almost use it now, Adam, like an online diary. Yep. But what that allows me to do is to build a relationship with an audience. What is it that strangers don't have in a selling situation? It's trust, credibility, and authority. What is putting yourself out there for the service of others in the form of content give you? Trust, credibility, and authority. And it happens to align with something that I kind of naturally do already. So yeah, man, that's changed the game for me for sure. Yeah, and I love it too. And, I, and for me, I think there's a balance between, you know, listen, we're, we, we are always selling something. We're selling no. ourselves. We're selling a product. We're, we're representing a client. But I think there's a balance there between not humble bragging, being authentic, and, and being your true self. So Julian, what, what does the word authentic mean to you?
what does authentic mean to me? I think it means, I think it really does mean being who you truly are without necessarily caring what other people think and truly being uniquely you and un- being unashamed of it, you know? Yeah. And, and I think it's about being vulnerable and, and, and open to and yeah. for me, and you and I have talked about, I talked about in your show too. For me, it was when I opened myself up and I was okay with sharing my true self and my true story and my failures and what happened to me and my story. And that's when it opened up where people were able to relate to it. Yeah. And that's what really helped, you know, you know, build, build my personal brand and, and open up this whole world of opportunities that you and I talk about all the time. And I think, you know, people struggle on LinkedIn where they want to be more their true self, but they're scared. Right? They're scared of what other people are, are going to think of them. And I think that that wall, you know, really has to come down um, and, you know, just breaking down of cyberbullying. And I think that the more that people are vulnerable and it's more acceptable that that's going to end. You know, I forgot who said this, but I, I will never forget this. It was a piece of public speaking advice that was given to me, but I, that I think was captured from uh, an author, I believe. But it's, it goes something to the effect of nobody cares about what you have to say until they know how much you care about them, That's a good right? Quote. It's like a real relationship. It really does break down all the other barriers. Yeah. And, and I think it, being you and finding a way to, to be vulnerable and okay with who you are in your own skin, I mean, that's what really sells, right? And specifically when you're using LinkedIn, it's really about everyone like hides behind these online facades and it's really about picking yeah. up the phone, starting with that phone call, starting with that first Zoom, right? Like look at somebody, mm-hmm. even though you're, you're across the country, and have those conversations. I think that's really the 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 ultimate, like the 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 heart, the nugget of LinkedIn is that connecting. Mm-hmm. I mean, even Jeff Weiner talked about that. You know, in his keynote, is bringing people together, better together. That that was a hashtag there. Mm-hmm. Um, public speaking, something that you know you are great at, that you built a lot of success upon. Someone like myself who is starting out in that journey, what advice would you give to me to help me land more speaking gigs? You know, this also is advice given to me, but the thing that comes to me is, is focus on the message and be yourself. For me, I have struggled for years with speaking anxiety. Even to this day, people, people think I'm lying, but it is the truth. If there's one natural thing about me is I don't really look nervous when I actually am, but people who know me can see when I'm having nerves. And before I speak every single time, man, I get the negative thoughts. I get the butterflies. Am I going to forget what I'm going to say? Am I going to not connect with the audience and all that stuff, right? But what focusing on the audience does, it focuses, it takes the pressure off of you and more so on your ability to be of service to the audience. I don't know if you've ever volunteered for anything before, but whenever you are truly there, not for yourself, but for others, it takes the pressure off. And for me, that is what I focus on when it comes to crafting content, focusing on the message, not yourself. Now the be yourself piece is this. The more of whatever it is that you are, the more truly unique you become and you start to separate yourself from everyone else. And the beautiful thing about that is you don't need to change. You just need to be more of you because whatever you are is 100% already unique. And when you start to find that intersection of your natural strengths, areas of interest and value creation for others, it's like you start to find this incredible place that you're so uniquely tailored to. That also exists in the speaking arena. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic, man. And, and thank you for helping me get that opportunity. And I'm look, I was looking back on the video earlier and I'm like, you know, we're, we're our harshest critics sometimes. You know, I went back after the yep. event. I'm like, all right, maybe I was a little nervous at first. Maybe, you know, I, I said some things I would have said differently, but I went back and looked at it and I'm like, I didn't do that bad. You know, I, I thought I it was great. Think, yeah, I don't think I did that bad. I think I said some things that sounded half intelligent <laughs> that will maybe help me land, you know, my, my, next, my next gig. And plus it, it didn't hurt that we had a killer panel up there, man. I mean, we had yeah. some great people. Um, you know, you did a fantastic job. So you've been giving a lot of advice um, around podcasts and, and personal branding. Let's talk a little bit about some life advice. What is the single greatest piece of advice that you ever received that you take action on daily? I think it really is this idea of doing work that you love. I mean, that is just something that's so consistent to me. And you and I both have talent acquisition backgrounds. And that's actually also part of the reason why I started this whole thing because I have hired hundreds of people, world-class professionals in technology, project management, sales, you name it, and I've interviewed thousands. And I can say pretty definitively, 
almost most people out there hate what they do and don't find fulfillment in it, right? So for me, it is find whatever it is that you love. And that's not throwaway advice. When you do something that you love, it like unlocks energy, creativity, and enthusiasm. It draws out the best version of yourself. And for me, whenever I am doing something that I love, success is less something that I chase. It becomes something I attract. Yeah. Like, I, like I didn't reach out to you. you. You came to me as a result of actually the stuff that I was creating, mm-hmm. right? It's a law of attraction, man. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's it, man. Go do something and don't compromise. Whatever it takes, find whatever it is, that thing that you love. What's next on the Julian Placino entrepreneurship journey? So what seems to be happening, my primary business now is I do strategy consulting for staffing firms, leadership, marketing, business development, that kind of thing. But this podcast, it it seems to be kind of turning into like a media company in the form of the podcast, in the form of the speaking. I'll be releasing my first book next year. I just signed with a speaker's agent. So she's sending me all over the world now. So Um, And also, I've been kind of a natural storyteller. And as you mentioned, I was cast to be in the Amazon docuseries, The Social Movement, how entrepreneurs can come together and create social impact. Well, I I, I had a pretty good performance, and I was invited to be the pitch coach for season two. So I'm going back to Montreal next year. And I say that because I think, I know, Adam, that it's in me to start creating inspirational docuseries. And I think that's what's in the front. All of that, Pathways Media, which is still a figment of my imagination is going to own all those properties. Make it happen, man. Yeah. Right. It's crazy. This manifestation. And we talked about like the whole, my whole Gary V thing from, mm-hmm. from the, it's, it's a manifestation of putting yourself in the right place at the right time with the right experience, with the right people around you and magic's going to happen. Yeah. It's, it's bound to happen. Julian, what, what is, what does legacy mean to you? I, I mean, what, what do you feel you know, your legacy is going to be when you eventually leave this earth? What do you know, this is, you by? This, is a, this is a tough question because I, I've gone back and forth about legacy. Whenever I start, in my, in my experience, I can't speak for anyone else except for myself. Whenever I start focusing on legacy, it becomes sort of like a narcissistic thing. Like, this is what I want to do to be sort of remembered as. But reg- regardless of what you believe, like once you're gone, you're sort of gone. So for me, it's like, I'm trying to see what's the tangible impact I can make today. And hopefully as a result of that, I will leave some kind of impact, you know? So, so for me, it really is about the discovery, the development and the deployment of my talents and abilities to be of service to other people. And the more I'm able to do that, focus on that and not sort of material things, the more I'm able to live in fulfillment. And a word that people don't often discuss, Adam, is this word peace. It is not a (laughs) sexy word by any means, but that word word. is anti to my personality. Mm -hmm. But when I am feeling peace, it's like I can be still and happy and even joyful in the moment. How does Julian handle stress? Still working on that one, to be honest with you. (laughs) Um, I think it goes back to focusing on my values, right? Um, And the reason why I think having values is important because it serves as kind of a compass of how to make decisions because at any given time we're thrown with so much opportunities and choices. For me, mine has always been my faith, my family, and also I love entrepreneurship, you know? And if a decision does not align with one of those things, I have to cast it aside. So for me, there is a very critical process of sort of resting and recharging and focusing on what's important in my life. And speaking of compasses, Julian, what, what is your North Star? What do you look towards for gratitude? What do you look towards when you're not having a good day, a good week, when things aren't going well? And on the inverse, you know, when things are going great, everything's, you know, firing on all cylinders. What is your North Star? I think as far as the gratitude is, I've been a habitual goal setter for years. I have books and books of goals that I've written down and achieved. And I think for me in the very begin, very early morning, I do have very specific practices, right? So I get up, I do my, I do my, my Bible readings, um, I meditate, I go over my goals, I exercise, and then I spend the rest of my day relentlessly executing the things that I've set for that day. Love it. So for me, it's forcing the gratitude and not just intellectually letting it appear, but feeling the emotions of it. Adam, when you first met me, I was still working at Bottle Rock. Yep. I am literally living the dream right now, speaking to you on this podcast, talking about this journey, right? That is something to be incredibly grateful for. Yeah. 
I so bet. for me, it's, it's that. It's really being grateful and experiencing those emotions and feelings. And I'm grateful to be along for the ride, man. Yeah. And, and last but not least, what do you do better potentially than anybody in this world? What is your superpower? I think people who know me would argue that I have a pretty strong ability to communicate, right? But I think that is one of my strengths, but I think my superpower really is it's having, it's having the guts to go do something that I love despite what other people say about me. And yes, it has been fearful, but every time I have pushed past a fear, I seem to grow and expand because I see a lot of people talk about things that they want to do, but not do anything about it. Me, sometimes I'm too quick to act, but I know I can act and I grow as a result of doing it. My friend, that is called tenacity. Yeah. That's what you and I have in spades. And I think that is the magnet that draws us together. Yeah. Thank we're doers, you. man. Totally. Yeah. We're doers. We're makers. We make shit happen. And, and that's what I think. I, I, I can't sit on the sideline. Yeah. I can't sit on the sideline. When I see an opportunity, I, I have to take it. And I didn't have this my whole life. Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't until I pivoted and, and had like, you know, my lowest point. We talked about this. Until yeah. I started, Julian, thank you. And, you know, in, in, in closing, you know, my relationship with Julian is proof in point that real networking and taking your online offline works. And we took it from an initial phone call to co-producing a successful live networking event in Fireside Chat at City Central that streamed globally on LinkedIn Live and YouTube. And this happened because we communicated frequently and we built a trusting relationship. We took a chance on each other. We did. It took yeah. a little bit of trust. And we also took that risk and we found and believed in fate and faith. Two things that we definitely believe on. And Julian and myself have a deep inner tenacity that drives us. It drives us to create and connect in deep and meaningful ways, focus on building long-term mutual valuable relationships. And this did not happen overnight. You know, I said it before, it took time and work for us to build where we are today. And I implore all of you to take a moment and think if you are being transactional, short-term, or focus on the long game as it is the only game in town. Trust me on that one. Don't play the short game, play the long game. And I hope that our story together and Julian's own pathway to his success has inspired you to do, to make, to connect, and to create. Julian, thanks for joining me. I appreciate you and I appreciate your time and where could folks connect with you? You can reach out to me at julianplacino.com and you can search Julian Placino on any platform. I'm most active on LinkedIn. And we will link to all of his LinkedIn and other links below. Julian, thank you for coming on. Thank you. Can't Adam. wait to do some more stuff with you. Can't wait to get our uh, Dallas event up and out pretty shortly, hopefully before this podcast airs. And to everyone joining, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Please be sure to follow us on all the social media channels below. Remember, Take your online, offline, things like this happen. They're real. Make shit happen. And thanks for joining us. Take care and catch us next week for another great episode of the podcast. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode, jam-packed with more incredible humans. For more info, please visit www.nhptalentgroup.com.